So what went wrong for England in this weekend's Calcutta Cup? So welcome back to BD Rugby. After the weekend's disappointing defeat to Scotland in the first game of the Six Nations, I wanted to look at what you know, what were the negatives, what were the positives, what were the takeaways that we can take from this first game for Steve Borthwick in charge. So in terms of, I'll start with the negatives and we'll end with the positives. So in terms of the negatives, I think one of the things that really struck me was around the game line dominance. Now, if you look at the stats, you know, England had the best, in 2022, England had the, the best dominant carry rate and they were second for committing two or more tackles across all tier one nations. That may well surprise you because it did surprise me. But I felt on Saturday that England did really lack that. I felt that actually they played a lot off nine, which, you know, is particularly predictable after time. And and people, you know, contrary to reports, I actually think that the the work rate was spread across the team. I don't think it just relied on certain people like uh, Genge and Chesham, which uh, a number of reports reported. I thought people like Ludlam, Curry did do that. But actually, did they... Did their dominance in terms of carrying ever really stress the defence? And I think sometimes that comes down to variation. I think England are quite predictable. You know, this is a good defensive Scotland team. They have a, a coach who was selected to be the coach for the Lions. You know, they defend very well, but it's easy to defend when it's quite predictable. I actually think it's sometimes um, Alex Dombrant was quite useful because he does attack a little bit wider out and they, you know, he had some unforced errors throughout the game, and but I think actually you need to focus on what he was trying to do. And he's trying to tack up wider. And a couple of times when England did play the ball inside, that's when it led to tries because it changes the point of contact. I think the other thing is linked to that is England are playing a very um, low risk game. So actually the other thing to try and move the contact, which I discuss in one of the other videos, is trying to encourage the offload. And again, there were sort of times when teams did that. But actually, if you can get offloads through the forwards, not just relying on the backs, I think that changed the point of contact and it sort of links to, you know, generating quicker ball speed um, and, and therefore opportunities to score. I think the other point is it links to the fact that actually this whole um, Farrell-Smith axis, I won't go into that, but I think by not having a 12 that is able to carry and willing to carry, and that doesn't mean you have to have a big... Guy at 12, you know, a Tuolangi or a, a Radradra, you, you, you can have someone who just willingness to take and right, run the right angles. It means that if you're not generating that um, defensive stress, then you've actually got another point that you can use at 12. And I don't think that England have that. Um, and, you know, running marching in is not really going to achieve that either. So I do think that if England aren't able to win that dominance and stress that defence from their forwards, then we kind of lead to a sort of problem where we're not we're not necessarily um, being able to put them, you know, get behind the defence and start to create space. I think the other thing that I've noticed, and, and England have been prone to this for a while, is that they're really failure to adapt to unorthodox play. I think what, the thing that really frustrated me watching the game was for, uh, Scotland used um, long line out, so extended the line out a lot and got quite a lot of success from it. And actually, I think the problem was is that, you know, it's all right if it happens once, you think, far enough. But if it's can repeatedly happening, why is that not being addressed on the field? Because that's surely something quite simple to address. And that may probably comes down to leadership and having people with the awareness and talking with each other. It made me think a little bit about the New Zealand game when New Zealand obviously came with this tactic to kick quite early on across field and they did it repeatedly and England again struggled and you could almost see the panic that it creates in England and perhaps you know this is guilty of England being so structured that when anything goes outside the norm they really struggle you know there was talks reports of Townsend employing a kind of organized chaos and and I wonder if teams are looking at England and saying this is the way you deal with this England. They're a very drilled, structured team with players who can play a certain way. But if you put them, if you perform or play slightly outside the box, and it wasn't a surprise to me that Scotland in the second half stopped kind of kicking from deep and actually started playing from, from deep because it was the same problem. When a team doesn't traditionally clear their lines and exit and they maybe run the ball, England are all at sea. Um, and I think we probably saw bits of this against Australia in, in the autumn where when Australia tried to run the ball, England really found that quite difficult because 
they're expecting a team to do a certain thing. And once they don't, they can't seem to adapt on the field. And I'd really like to see England over the next couple of games address that because I think that kind of brings on a lot of problems. And I think that other teams will look at this. And I wouldn't be surprised if even your structured teams like France and Ireland who play a certain way may do certain variations when they come up against England because they've seen it kind of works. Um, and so I think England need to sort of address that. And I think that probably comes down to leaders, but it may be just being pointed out and giving them the tools to be able to adapt that. So there are two sort of my main negatives. But I mean, there was a lot of positives in the game. Don't get me wrong. It was actually really nice to watch an England team, you know, where I got out of my seat and I started shouting at the screen again. You know, I think the important thing for me was, which I addressed in one of my videos, was that I felt the ruck speed was better and that intensity at the ruck was better. So as I pointed out before, you can look at average ruck speed and that can kind of be misleading because it depends on the, the style of the game. You know, you're going to have slower ruck speed if you're actually intentionally trying to slow it down. But England were able to get that ball back quickly when they needed to. Some of that links to the fact that the carries were good. Um, contrary to what I'm saying, but they were good. But also the ball presentation was much better. If you notice, people are making a real effort to get that ball away. And there was definitely emphasis on moving that ball wide and into space. And I think what was really nice is to see England build score off multiple phases. That hadn't happened for a long time. You know, we weren't relying on tries out of the blue that you wouldn't happen again. You know, that's something that they can take across all games, that multiple phase play forward into changing with backs. And I thought that really looked well. And, you know, you know, even though I've touched on this sort of Ford Farrell, uh, Ford Smith axis, you know, actually that when it came to that phase play, that did work. Um, I'm not a fan of it personally, but I think that, you know, in terms of the tacking wise, it did type the click, which is quite a positive if they do actually persevere with it. And I think the, the last thing I'd like to point out, and I think from a personnel perspective, there were some real players who sort of stood up and actually in positions that I feel like we've always not been quite concrete. So I think Oli Chesham had a really good game at second row. I think of, again, contrary to what I say about the carries, I think he was the one player, perhaps Genge, but he was the one player who when he takes the ball on he's looking to go past the player there's no kind of take the ball up and almost go to ground too easily yeah you present the ball but you don't actually put the you don't get behind this defense and put them on the stress if you look at him when he carries he's carrying as if he's going to go through you and I think he repeatedly did that and he got a good, good good lot of good forward ball and I think England have for years really struggled for that second person in the second row I mean you think about the names who have played next to Atoja over the years and I would say after that performance that he's got, you know, he's going to play for a good number of tests as long as we can keep him fit. And then equally, I think the balance across the back row was good. I think Lewis Ludlam in particular at six was really good. I mean, it's not like he's new to the player, but giving him that sort of, he, his work rate is really good. And I think that's what you expect from him. You expect high work rate, high carries, tackles, and actually also was offering quite a lot in the line out. And again, I think, from a six perspective, I think he really fills that void really well. Looking ahead to the next test, I don't expect them to make big changes. I thought there was a couple of people that I would look to change. I think in the back row, I wasn't overly convinced with Tom Curry. Uh, not Tom Curry, Ben Curry. I think at seven. Again, from a carrying perspective, I don't think he made the, enough impact. There wasn't really, it didn't, I didn't, I don't remember him getting any turnovers. Um you know, he didn't really stand out. And I think where we've got such a good player pool, you know, Ben L comes straight on. And I, although he got penalised for going over the ball, I thought that was, to be fair, legitimate. And I think actually um, he just showed you there what he can offer. He, he carries well. And I, potentially he's just got slightly bit more to offer. And obviously people like Jack Willis, who have you know, gone on about on here, I think would be a, a really good addition as well. So I would be surprised if Ben Curry starts and whether he even stays in the squad um not that we completely get rid of him but yeah didn't didn't do enough for me and then I suppose we we need to tackle this sort of 10 12 axis we've got to bring someone in at 12 I don't know who that is if you look across the squad there isn't really a 12 there if Dan Kelly's injured who else is a 12 arguably Chiwilani's not a 12 he's played for sale but played most of his career on outside centre and the wing and actually they're quite distinctly different positions but possibly if, if Dan Kelly's not fit, you you have to go with Tuolangi. You just need you need a little bit better balance in that position. You need to have that outlet. And as I say, if you're not getting that 
generation through you forward, you've got to have something from 12. And unfortunately, I think that's playing one off Farrell or Smith. And I, to be honest, I'd play either of them. But I think you've got to play that. Other positions, you know, there could be changes, but I think it's literally having one playing, one on the bench. I'd give continue to give people like Hassel Collins, who I don't think had the best game, but I think it's one of those games where, as a winger, you've got to get a feel for the international. I think just giving him time, he'll come through. Equally, I think, potentially, I'm still not convinced that Sinclair's playing his best rugby. Yes, people talked about him carrying a lot, but again, going back to my original point, perfect example of someone who may have the numbers in terms of carries, but can you tell me a time in the game where he ever carried and really stressed the defence and we thought we're going somewhere here? It feels very much like running up in a kind of almost a training kind of way, which, you know, I think if England are going to do anything more, they need to get back to those dominant carries and, and, and that may well be a personnel thing or it might be a mindset thing. But I think generally there was the positives from this were good. I think we're going in the right direction. I think we can address those couple of points, get back to where we're at and trying to get a balance. And it may well be that as we try to address one thing, we drop off on one thing. And it's trying to just try to get that balance. You've got to remember the Leicester team that did win the Premiership. When um, Borthwick came in, there was a period where they kind of had these type of results for a while as he was trying to embed certain purposes, um, processes, certain characteristics, certain mentality into the team. It may be not a surprise that those players who are from Leicester, so Chesham, Genge, Stewart, perhaps they felt more comfortable and perhaps they were able to play more their game, um, whether or not. So, I mean, there's lots of other things I haven't touched on. I haven't touched too much on the Ford Farallex as the defensive system. We know there's things wrong, but those are my main takeaways from, from the weekend. I would like to do some more videos as I'm going through. Hopefully, we'll um, do it when England are winning. Um, although it'll be interesting against, a, again, a very unorthodox Italian team and the way that they're playing at the moment. So thanks for your time again for watching these videos. Please subscribe and any comments or anything that you want me to focus on, please let me know. Um, and um, I'll be posting something again in, in the next week. Take care. Speak to you later. Bye.